All right, so I'm here with my friend Ivan Handler. Uh, I have an interest in healthcare technology from the point of view of making it more human-centered and human-friendly, and supporting the relationship and the patient story, and then the story that the clinician and the patient will write together that is ongoing. It's a never-ending story. And Ivan is here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll be quick. So uh, my background is crazy. I'm a mathematician by training, a pathologist, which will be important um, in a short while. Um, I started computing in 1963 when I was 14 years old. I am 16, 17, if anybody out there actually know what I just said? Oh, there's going to be a few hands up. There's going to be a few hands up. Um, I was the CIO of our state Medicaid and child support agency before I became the CIO of our health information. And so I've got uh, you know, over 11 years of background just in that, plus I've done a lot of work in healthcare and almost every other industry over my consulting career, blah, blah, blah. Let's get started. All right, so let's go here. How technology must support relationships. So how about you give us what you think is your definition of care in the healthcare and technology space. What is your definition? And he's going to get up. I've got a bum knee. That's why we got chairs. Yeah, yeah mine just did that too. Put it in your pocket. Yeah. No. All right. So, so let me uh, start off talking about care. Um, where I, want, I start off with uh, this guy named Martin Buber. Some of you may or may not know who he was, but he was a very important Jewish um, theologian, and he talked about relationships as having two poles. One is called I thou, the other one is called I it. And it's not We're just making a mess up here. You know, my experience with technology is, if it's working, it's not. So this is good. <laughs> this is good. All right. So I'll be quick. So, so that's the first important thing. The I-thou relationship is the kind of personal, mutual empathy and uh, identification with each other. The I-it is the things that need to be done. The I-thou is when you're talking with your physician and you know they care about you. The I-it is... You know, what meds do I need? What are the process, what are the processes? Okay, so that's that's the spectrum. But here's what I haven't heard today, and I think it's important. The relationship between the patient and the provider is not just between two individuals. A hospital is a provider, right? Institutions are also providers. And in my experience as a patient, I've had I've been on a general aesthetic about three times in the last 12 months. Nothing serious, but I can tell you that the, my, my caregivers were wonderful, the institution was horrible, right? The relationship I could have with you know, people was great, but it didn't get translated to the institution, and if I had to go to some other institution, everything is lost. Yeah, yes. Bottom line, nobody marries a building, but we end up forced into relationships with buildings. So, so, that's, right, so that's we're going we're gonna to move to the role of technology. Is yeah. that, I, I'm his leash, basically, because this guy, if you think I talk fast and a lot, oh my god. But he's also brilliant, so I want to make sure he gets it all out. So, here is the current reality versus emerging practice, and technology and human relationship does it the blend. Now, can you sketch out how tech could enhance versus the current prevention model of uh, the doctor-patient relationship? How do you see that unfold? Right, and by the way, so I was just with my friend who um, is at uh, Harvard at Brigham, and he told me, this, just, I think this came out, which is his view. So first thing, you know, as a patient, you've got maybe 18 seconds before you get interrupted by your doctor, right? So that's the first problem. Um, the other problem is you see here, um, you know, looking at the back of your physician's head while they're um, typing in data to a computer. The problem is this, physicians only have about 15 minutes to spend with you, and then, Ten of them, a lot of times, are data entry. It's pretty ridiculous. What we want, the emerging practice, has to do with getting the computer out of the way, right? Technology is a tool. It is not supposed to be an obstacle. Right now, it's an obstacle. So what we're going to talk about is how do we, not that we're going to not have any technology, but 
the relationship should be what's out front, and the technology should be in the background supporting that, right? Right, right, right. now what we have is the opposite. Yeah, and uh, by the way, I do need to point out that a friend of the Society for Participatory Medicine is the doctor holding the iPad with the, doc with the patient in the hospital. That's Henry Feldman from uh, BIDMC. All right, so this is the mapping that we have for this process. Can you explain this for us? Sure. Tell us what you mean. So again, we're thinking about a relationship, right? So how do we, I'm an engineer, right? So how do we translate this kind of fluffy stuff we think about relationships into something that's concrete. Because if it's not concrete, we're not doing any good. So to start with, mutual identification, well identification is something obvious, right? You have a patient ID, you have a patient history, um, you've got a relationship that's been established. So identification is the first thing. You're not, you know, your physician needs to know who you are. And I don't just mean he knows my name as Ivan Handler, he knows my age. Probably my family, my interests, right? I mean, what does it mean to, to start this? So that's important information. But if you just think about it again for an individual, you and your doctor, we've missed the point. How do we get the institutions also involved in this? So the information gets around, not you, you don't have to keep on saying the same thing every time you see a new physician. How many people are gonna do that, right? Yeah. All of us, right? So yeah. once you've got the identification, then it's the patient needs and the knowledge of the patient. And this is where the active voice that people have been talking about, which I think is such an important idea, comes in. How do we you know, interject that patient voice and what has to happen right here? It's not the question of the physician did all these tests, they came back with a variety of blank and snow bench codes and tells you what's going on. No, 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 no. We need to hear from the patients. That's what people have been talking about and that's what's gotta go in here. And then, so some of this is now mechanical. Now we're getting into the eye part. Patient problems, automated patient problem list, the patient history. This is stuff that we should expect to see, but in my experience, this can be really murderous, especially if you're going from one specialist to another specialist, especially if they're not in the same um, program, right? Oh my God, what a nightmare. So Ivan, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to inter I'm going to interject with the question that I've been dying to ask, yeah. or the point I've been dying to make. It's like I would really like to see this get turned into Tinder for healthcare. <laughs> yeah, swipe and left, swipe and right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is this is what you came up with yeah. as the outline of sort of the four buckets yeah. of the you know data the data set. So walk us through this one. Yeah. And the, well, this. There's probably a whole lot more than four, but let's start with this. Okay? So first, of course, there's a patient encounter and engagement, right? That's where things start. The patient and a provider, sometimes they start off, what happens? Well, we want data capture. And I have a lot to say about that. We need, inter we need the data captured accurately. It needs to be relevant. We need, you know, re readability, privacy, all this stuff we know about that. I like voice recognition. The tech, how many people have got an uh, Alexa at home, and, you know, an Amazon Alexa or a Google home? The technology is now here. Why should you watch the physician enter the data into the, why not just talk? Why not grab that information from the conversation you're having with your provider, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Machine learning can be done on audio too, right? Yeah, machine learning could be, I have, machine learning is somewhat problematic. That's something else. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> <laughs> and then referrals. Referrals are, I think, one of the worst problems that we have. You don't, it's not Marcus Welby anymore, and I think people don't, Physicians, Do we have to explain who that is? <laughs> <laughs> you don't, see, you're, you're never, you're never, you don't actually visit with a single provider anymore. You visit a team, even if you only see a single person. Referrals are a nightmare. How, you know, they're an absolute nightmare, especially if you're poor and on Medicaid. Where are you going to go? Yeah. Where's that provider? How do I get you know, into their schedule? I mean, it's a nightmare. It should go quickly. You should be able to say, I want you to refer over here. Let's get it in, in, the, in this person's particular schedule. Oh, you need transportation? Why, why, you know, why not have all that happen right away? The technology can allow that to happen right now, away. Now, on formularies, uh, is there anybody here who is not clear on what formulary means? And I mean, you can be honest. In it's a list of allowed medicines. Yeah, it's a list of allowable medicines, but it's complicated, especially in this country. 
So you can have another, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I had um, some surgery, I needed to get some sleep, I wasn't doing very well, my physician prescribed me in some kind of opioid. I went down to get it, you know, get, get it, and of course it was denied. <laughs> Why, because it's not in my formula. They had another one, it, was, it had another one, it was only $60, you know, for 10 pills. Uh, I gave up the whole thing, but the point is, my physician didn't know what he could prescribe for me. Didn't know. Yeah. And that's incredible. How can you have a system where the physician can't prescribe, doesn't know what they're prescribing? I mean, another example is a buddy of mine wrote a letter to Tampa years ago. He's at Harvard. He um, had a patient that couldn't afford the meds he needed, and he needed to get it. So my buddy bought him the meds, because he's a physician and he cares. What happened? He gets written up for doing, you know, for doing something unbelievably wrong, he was, you know, giving money to a patient, right? He was caring for a patient. He wrote a letter to Jam about this, and then he, he made it written. But the point is, there's no connection here. Yeah. Obvious things. All right. So this is your framework, your yeah. FRIST framework. So we've got privacy, reliability, interoperability, security, and trust. We're going to first go to privacy, and my favorite guy, the HIPAA <laughs> So let me just also, uh, this is from a paper I published in Nitrically Computer in February, so if you're interested, it's out there, or get a hold of me and I'll send you a copy. Um, so I was involved with health information exchanges, which are a disaster in this country, if you ask me, but one of the, and one of the reasons they're a disaster is there's nothing really systematic about any of them that I can tell. So the first thing, of course, we have to con be concerned about is privacy. But as you, how many have heard of the social determinants of health, the dentist, the medicine, right? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty common. Well, the problem is with healthcare, if you're limited to clinical data only, you can't do your job. So you need to be able to get through more than just one set of data, but it's in different domains. So yeah. what I've decided to do is generalize the idea of HIPAA. I know people hate HIPAA, but really it's a good model. It really is a good model. And if we were to do this and divide up things into different domains, there's a health domain, there's unfortunately a mental health domain, which is different in this country, shouldn't be, there's um, financial. Yeah, like your brain is not part of your body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, so, <clears throat> finance, military, education, blah, blah, blah. There's all these different domains. Well, why don't we just make them all very similar to HIPAA, where you have, um, HIPAA has something called the TPO exception, right? So that's um, for, um, Keep on the treatment, payment, and operations. Yes. Well, let's call that, I mean, what that's all about is when you go to your doctor for some, you know, because you've got some condition you want it solved, if the physician needs to share your data with another provider in order to give you what you want, you can do it. That's the right. real thing. Well, I call this accessible, uh, accountable use. I want to accountable use, that's actually. Uh, yeah. So the idea is in every domain, if, you know, if you should be able to share data with whatever you need to in order to get you know, the service. If you've got to go beyond through domains, that's when you need a consent. Yeah. And, you know, and moving well, from this black box to a more transparent. Right. Which is where we want to go. Now, reliability is, I, I'm, I'm moving quickly here. So, reliability is a very big concern of mine. Where did the data come from? How do you know it's accurate? How do you know, um, you know, it, it, what's the provenance? I mean, the provenance is so important. Where did this data come from? Especially when we're sharing data. Now, that, luckily, the HIEs are still bad. We can't share it right now, but sooner or later, we're going to be really sharing well, data. Well, like Grace said earlier in her presentation about the whole meds list that was not correct. Right. When, how'd that even get in there? So, we need some way to get data to be more reliable. One, where did it come from? Who entered it? Why do we trust it? You know, for example, if it's on a lab test, how do we know the lab equipment? When was the last time the lab equipment went through appropriate maintenance? Mm. Right? It's very, these are important things that we don't care about. And um, wasn't, Dave, wasn't, uh, if Dave's still here, didn't one of your lab results come back that you were a woman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there, the reliability is important. Right. Okay, next we have interoperability. And this is, this yeah. Is, this is my major and many people's major, I think. Why do you think this is on my chest? Anyway. So interoperability has to do with the fact that when you get a piece of data, it represents what it's supposed to represent. 
and you don't have to do anything to it. Let me give you an example of where it goes wrong. Um, in our health information exchange, we eventually started collecting all the public health information that needed to go to the federal government. And if you know anything about this, um, if for example, STDs, AIDS, you know, other kinds of diseases that need to be reported. This is reported in something called HL7 2.5.1, which is a particular standard. Um, every time we got a new hospital in, we had to hire a programmer, even though they gave us the data in exactly the right format, the format is so loose that it, was, you know, it wasn't interoperable. And this is a, should be a concern to all of us because when data is not interoperable, that means you, you know, you're fantasizing about what something means. You don't actually know. And this is a problem. So you have a standard like HL7 or a LOINS. If everyone puts things in slightly differently, you don't have a standard. You have a standard for every single individual who's putting in the data. Uh, right? Yeah, precision medicine, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is scary. No. <laughs> this is scary, and I think, and in my experience in the healthcare field is because you know people care about care, they don't understand the relevance of data when we're in this situation of high technology. The data mediates everything, and if we don't get it right, we're hurting ourselves. Right. So this is interoperability is incredibly important, and it's not. And now impressed. we've come to storming the castle. <laughs> so the security piece. Yes. So security and. Again, this is a huge area and it's a very expensive area, but obviously we need to know that the data can't be breached. And that means a couple of things that I don't, people want to talk to me afterward, I'm happy to go into this forever. Oh, but, he can go on. But <laughs> the point is, you know, one, you need to store the data encrypted at rest. This is hard for a lot of electronic medical records because they were written in the you know, in the 19th, in the 20th century, not in the 21st century, and they can't deal with um, encrypting data, which is scary. Um, obviously, you need to securely transmit data. It needs to be encrypted very well. Data storage needs to be protected um, from the peripheral, right? You don't want someone coming in and trying to get a hold of the storage. Um, and by the way, this is where encryption comes in. If you know about the way things work with HIPAA, if someone breaks into your data repository and steals your data, you've got a HIPAA breach unless the data was encrypted, in which case, no one cares. It's a bunch of ones and zeros, they right. don't know. And then the final thing, which I think is extremely important, is audit trails. And it's not just important from a security point of view, but it's also important from the patient point of view. Who was looking at my data? Why were they looking at my data? Do you know that right now? No. You don't know that. No. You don't know that about, you don't even know who's got your medical data. You probably don't know that your credit card agency knows more about you than possibly than many of the physicians. Facebook knows sure. more about me than my the HR does. Right. So that's security. And right. then the, you know, the sort of big one, trust. Do we trust, do we trust you? And so the way trust works, the ONC, one thing I really like about what they've done is for email, they've created this secure trust network. It needs to be expanded. The idea here is that institutions will guarantee they know who you are. And we have these trust networks so that you get certified by your institution. Your institution is responsible for that, by the way. And now, when I log in, I know the system knows who I am and it's verified that it's me, it's nobody else. Right? That's what we want for trust. We need these trust networks. Right now, I'd say the only problem is they only exist for email, and email is important, but you know, it, it, yeah. no, by nowhere, nowhere close to what we need to do. But All right, so we have, whoops, wait a minute. Oh. Okay, there we are. Okay, yeah. Um, so we've got privacy, reliability, interoperability, um, as security. security and trust. Sorry, I, it's not my word, so mm -hmm. I have to walk my way through it. So where do you see, because you're so embedded in this, where do you see the biggest potential for this to emerge in the healthcare system? So, some of you may not like this, but I like starting small, and my experience, especially with large hospital complexes, is they're way too bureaucratic, you can't do anything this innovative. So what I'm looking for, um, critical access hospitals, uh, small clinics, somebody who's hurting, needs help, and would like to, you know, to participate in something like this. I really do want to build a project and I'm trying to go do this to create a you know, serious data sharing network and complementary uh, electronic medical records, though I don't, my own view is I don't like the current state of the EMR, I think is ridiculous. So 
we really want to re-engineer this. And I'm, uh, that, so that's what I'm interested in doing, if anyone's interested in, in so thinking about this. So a rural hospital, you know, maybe a rural hospital network, or, you know, yes. it's a rural hospital. Uh, who was interested in trying to break some new ground and they don't like what, what they've had well, to deal with so far. So in my three years. In Illinois, we have a network of 22 critical access hospitals that are very near to Bansky. Yeah. And, you know, they've got these really kind of bad electronic medical records, which are, they can barely afford as they are and they're not that functional. And, you know, in the rural areas, that, you know, people, it's hard to get to these clinics, or the hospitals, there's all kinds of things that need to be done. But I think if we can improve that, We've done a lot, and they're going to want to participate. It's not going to be like a large complex with hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of coming in all the Is time. Is Rasu in the room? Did Rasu come back yet? No, he hasn't come back. I was going to toss him a question about this, but since he's not here. Well, now, let me ask the favorite participatory medicine question, the SPM question on a loop. Uh, how can patients help? How can we in the room and the people who are in the communities that we are part of, you know, patient communities, et cetera, how can we help drive this forward? Tell your physician and the nurse and the administrator, anyone, tell them that you're not happy and tell them what you want. Like every time I go to the hospital, I always get a survey. I hate these <laughs> things, right? But I mean, you need to let them know, and because literally, we need to drive this from the bottom up. It's not going to come from the top down. So we need to tell people, let's, you know, we're not happy. And then hopefully we'll get something together and start something new. And then you can say, Wait, that, that looks good, right? <clears throat> I mean, I wish I, could, I wish I had a couple hundred billion dollars and I could tell you. Oh, Don't we all? all. Yeah. <laughs> but, no. still in the 50s that do. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave, Mr. DeBroncart. Has, um, has any of this tickled any of your synapses as you, you've been listening? What, what, what are your thoughts here? Where do you think the opportunity, you know, the first can opener could be applied? Well, I may be a little contrarian. Um, but, well, so I had an event from within the last hour, okay? Uh, I know there are a lot of people who want us to share data I know a lot of people involved in managing the health IT really don't care. I know there are illusions about who are leaders. Uh, on the cultural side, my experience is that the best leverage is when you've got a parent who's helping take care of a sick kid, there's a, motiv there's a motivation. It's on. Good. All right. There's, there's a motivation there that providers, in my experience, are more likely to uh, support, help people get their data. Same thing for the other direction, when you've got a middle-aged, what I like to, what's usually the alpha woman in a family, who's taking care of the elders, you know, the, the staff, yeah. right? But then on the other hand, we have my blessed hospital, Beth Israel Deacon is Boston, uh, which is the sponsor of Open Notes, but I got a gout blood test last week, and their patient portal people can't tell me how to, there is no way to look up the history yeah. Uh, yeah. of my, they said, here's how you can scroll through all your past lab results, but there's no way to search for it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, I had to do the same, you know, I, I have to man maintain my own data set. But with all of the weird so lab data. What I'll say is, I think the future has nothing to do with hospitals cooperating with us, except to release our data. And yeah. it's gonna be external apps yeah. that suck it out and pull it together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm particularly optimistic about this FHIR fire thing yeah. that's being developed. We'll uh, see. One thing I will, I will say, because we keep my um, memory about this, is the other problem with the information sharing right now is, for example, let's say you've got a patient, you've got a new patient who's been on Medicaid, uh, and has got chronic conditions, and it's got a record like this. The electronic medical record basically just sucks all that in, and the physician who's got 15 minutes to spend with this patient, what, is going to go through all this stuff? How that quickly? I mean, the way we share, it's raw data sharing doesn't make sense. The physician's looking for specific information when they're looking for the record. They're not looking at the whole record. 
we need a different way in through kind of what I call parameterized query, where physicians said, ah, my patient, I'm looking at for the diabetes problems my patient has right now. Give me the, uh, the history of the last month and a few other things, right? So the physician can hit the ground running rather than constantly either paging through a paper record or from those of you electronic record, scrolling all through this stuff. It's not efficient and it's not high tech. It's, it's, it's lunatic. So anybody have any questions, comments? Anyone want to throw a brick? What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I like your idea of telling the providers what you want and what you need. But it's really sad when they just look at you and say, oh, I know, I wish you could do open house. Oh, I wish we had a chair plan. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. I mean, you know, you, I mean, you're right. Keep asking because maybe someday it will resonate. But the provider's hands are sometimes tied because they're part of a large organization. And it's sad. Yeah, it is sad. Yeah. So um, speaking of data and data sharing and data breaches, this is a little off topic, but not entirely. Um, there's a group of us, some of us in the room, who have, I'm not sure what this is telling me to do, but I'm gonna tell it to Scott. <laughs> um, there, in case you don't know, uh, you've I'm sure heard of Cambridge Analytica and the problem with, with uh, the Facebook data and Cambridge Analytica and, and all that. Well, it's worse for patient communities I, we're doing a survey of the understanding of data sharing on Facebook, in Facebook communities. It is bit.ly forward slash cyberwoke. I will repeat that. bit.ly forward slash cyberwoke. I would like to have everyone in the room go take the survey and share it with all your friends. And now back to our show already. Right, right. Who else has a question? Back here. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's ridiculous. Well, we gotta go fight. Okay, well, we, we, we've been given the, the it's time, folks. So, I think it's time. We have one more question. Oh, one more question. I will dismiss okay. them once I right. have one more question, I promise. Them. Yes, sir. So, okay. yes, sir. Thank you for that. So, one thing is that when we ask for feedback from uh, physicians after the visit, you mentioned, uh, you say, Say what how you feel like you don't like the system, but for that you have to have the appropriate question because if it's about how the doctor treated you, you can't stay one star if you were treated very well and you hate the system. So it's also how how this, these feedback questions are designed. The second thing is, uh, I, I heard the speaker before the once in health speaker said that people are concerned about the data. People who people. The insurance companies, people, the hospitals, or people, the patients. Because you, as a patient, or if you have to cross the street to move your data, your CD from one from the Harbor to uh, the other hospital, uh, what is? Uh, do you own your own data from that hospital? Who owns the data? Is it the patient or is it the hospital? Well, I mean, I think mean, that I mean, my view should be your data, but I don't think anyone's got an answer to that question. It's there a very good question. There is only one state that even starts with New Hampshire. Everybody else is like, you know, everybody thinks, each actor thinks they are the owner. Uh, so. I mean, it's a serious problem. I could go on about that. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. He's here. He's here for the rest of the day. Come find him. Okay, give it up for Casey Kirby and Ryan Hammer.